Okay, so this is PCHEM. So we're going to talk about what is PCHEM and kind of give you an overview of what we're doing this semester. And so this is the fun part of science. We get to go into the quantum realm. This is a screenshot from, I think, Ant-Man and Wasp, uh, where they went deep into the quantum realm and it was real trippy and so on. And who knows what it is because we don't actually have tools to see down that small. Spectroscopy is the only tool that we have that can interact with atomic and electron level things. And this course is about spectroscopy. So we can't understand spectroscopy without understanding quantum, quantum mechanics. Good morning. And so we're gonna get into waves and particles and dark matter and dark energy and all of those kinds of things you might hear in the news and be confused about because they're confused about it. And so after this course, you'll have a good feel for how light interacts with matter. So there's a, a wide range of energy and distance scales in PCHEM 1 and 2. So at the end of the year, we're going to be dealing with sort of the global scale of energy use, uh, which is 425 times 10 to the 18 joules. Now that's an exajoule. So that first thing, the E joule, that E is a, is a metric prefix that you probably haven't used. You've used gigabytes and terabytes and so on, and maybe petabytes, but then above that is exa. So that's 10 to the 18. And that's the scale of like the global use of energy. So that's the last topic. So we're kind of starting in the spring semester and let's back up as we get closer and closer to where we are now. Um, then we get into the micron scale. And if you've got good vision, which mine is deteriorating fast, you should be able to see a, like a, a 0.1 millimeter or 100 micron particle. About, you know, smaller, slightly smaller than the width of a hair. And that's the best you can do with your eyes. To get any smaller than that, we need to get into the nano realm. And so then when we get into the nanometers, that's where we start to see quantum effects. We start to see uh, things that um, can't be explained with Newtonian physics. And so when we get into the nanometer range, which is about 1.1 nanometers is the diameter of a, a C60, which is like a little soccer ball of carbon. So that's that's the nanometer range of, of size scales. When I say quantum effects emerge, that means that uh, vibration and translation and rotation are quantized, meaning there's only certain energies that an electron or an atom can have or a molecule can have. Now, you may be used to that. You may be used to seeing that in, in especially in organic and so on, but, but that's that's bizarre behavior. Why can uh, an electron only have certain energies? Have you ever thought of that? Why can't an electron have whatever energy you give it? Okay, that doesn't make sense that there would be restrictions on what an electron can do. Okay, but there are. And we'll understand after this first few weeks why that is. What makes an electron only have certain energies? And it's really simple if you think about it. Take a guitar string, it has a certain tone to it, doesn't it? That tone is energy. Why does it only have one tone? And how do you change the tone? You change the tone by pinching it and changing the length scale. All you do is change the, the confinement of that string and now it has to have a different energy. And that's exactly what's happening with electrons. We change the length scale and it has a different tone or a different energy. We put more protons in the nucleus, and guess what? It's held tighter. That's like tightening the strings on a guitar, and it only has certain tones. We could change the mass of the string, and it would have a different tone, but it couldn't select its tone. It has to have a particular tone that's based upon its length scale, its mass, and how tight it is. And we'll have those same kind of analogies in this first part of the course to explain quantum behavior. Then we get into angstroms. So this little A with a circle on top, that's 10 to the minus 10 meters. The reason they introduced that unit is because that's the atomic bond length scale. Okay. And then we get into the smallest energy. The single, a single H2 bond is, like, is 32 zeta joules. <laughs> so we go from zeta to exa, which is an enormous range of energy in this year. Now, in terms of studying PCHEM, Here's our, here's our class discussion today. Uh, this is a Da Vinci quote. 
And this was just in somebody's email signature, and I, I saw that and I thought, oh, I love that quote. Study without desire spoils the memory and it retains nothing that it takes in. So let's, so what does this quote mean to you? <laughs> and you can pick out any one of those bolded words and, and tell me, you know, how that fits into it. And we're going to become very close as a family. So go ahead and start interacting. Yes. Without desire, it's really hard to focus because it's like, I don't really care about this topic. So I don't want to pay attention to it. But when you like the subject, get into it, actually yeah. like remember it. Yeah. So you're really, you're really hitting it. That's exactly what we're talking about. Yes. Well, maybe not. I mean, it is important to want to learn and to be interested, but also the desire, you have to have a um, motivation. So even if you don't like this topic or it doesn't interest you, if you don't have a motivation to learn it, as in I need to have a good grade to get into a program, mm -hmm. or you know I have to have this part of my major or whatever, if you don't have the motivation, then it's the same thing you're not going to retain it. Yes. And so those are perfect answers. Let me combine them, okay? You have to have the motivation, right? But the motivation typically fuels effort, right? But what I want to twist this a little bit is I want the motivation to try to fuel the desire. Because the desire to learn a material is the thing that will make it stick. Effort won't make it stick. And it's, that's why you may be frustrated in a lot of courses you try really, really hard on and still make C- minus and are worried about passing. It's because it's the desire of something. Something in that material has to interest you. So the motivation should be to, to find it curious, find it interesting in some way so that it will stick. Okay. Uh, it may be its application to something else. Okay. To understand something else. You may not desire necessarily spectroscopy, but spectroscopy is the tool for biochemistry spectroscopy is a tool for some other discipline that you're really interested in. And the better you understand spectroscopy, the better you'll be in that other discipline. So then we're starting to hit that desire to be good at something. So we're motivated to, to get into a program or to do well in a class or to finish the degree. Uh, but that has to, has to feed more into the desire channel than the effort channel. Because I mean, by this time in your life, I know you've tried things uh, with lots of effort and had little to, to gain from it. And I'm trying to break that. I'm trying to get past that barrier so that you can have it stick in your head. Okay. So let's combine those two. Okay. Good. Also, beware of the PCHEM storytellers. <laughs> people who have come through this course will tell you all kinds of things. You know, I've heard people say, well, you, you know, you got to do this, you got to do that, and so on. Or it's impossible the first time through, or all these kinds of things. Uh, a, a lot of times people exaggerate because they want you to think of the epic battles that they fought. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> they always make it sound way worse than it is because that makes them feel better because... I mean, it's great to overcome challenges, but when you're telling the person behind you, you know, the challenges grow a little bit and they, they make it sound uh, insurmountable. It's not. Okay. And I'm here for you and your TAs are here for you and your classmates are here. So y'all can join together. You can work on the material. Just turn in your own work. Uh, don't start with someone else's spreadsheet. Those kinds of things. Uh, don't plagiarize. Ten consecutive words from another source without citation is plagiarization. So ten consecutive words. That's a small amount. So you need to use your own words. We're not asking for a large amount of, uh, um, you know, rambling text. It's not like you have, there's no length uh, minimum on your lab reports. It's just, you've got to show the TA and me that you know something about the material that you studied. Okay, so always take uh, prior knowledge with a grain of salt. Okay, so where are you and, and where can you move to? So this is, um, this is a nice little four by uh, two by two matrix. Okay, I can, I can't, I will, I won't. Okay, and so this is the best green light box. I can and will do it. But it is the work in the course. Um, I can't, but I want to. That's good. We can work with that. <laughs> what we can't work with are the bottom two. I can, but I make poor decisions, and I can't, and I won't try. <laughs> We've got to move people upwards. You know, out of the won't side, out of the won't row, and into the into the will. If you will, then maybe we can work with you to get you from the can't to the can't. Okay. 
So study the syllabus. We'll go through some of the points here in a second. And then if there's a conflict between the syllabus and Blackboard, kind of like rock, scissors, paper, the syllabus beats Blackboard. Okay, it's sort of our contract between us. Now that means occasionally if I find something in the syllabus that's poorly worded or ambiguous, or you have a question and you send it and I say, yeah, I should clarify that. Then I will clarify it. I will post a new syllabus. And then at the top of the syllabus will be the change uh, log. The what's changed and, and, and why, if it's like a typo or misspelling or something like that. Okay, now I've done this course, um, you know, several different ways. I always change it. Uh, to keep it fresh and a couple of semesters ago I did a, a points scale and so I just this morning was going through the syllabus getting ready for class and I found a couple of instances where it still refers to the points scale okay so I'm gonna be making that change this afternoon and I'll post a new one um, so I'll point out that uh, this morning all right our first homework assignment is due this coming Saturday night this is not bad since we're starting on a Monday. This was always a freak out whenever we started on Wednesday. People were saying, oh my goodness. But uh, it's not hard. It's just um, really to get you familiar with, with uh, the homework scheme this year. Uh, this will be much, much easier, much more clear what's required of you. So if you've heard the PKIM storytellers about the required pages and so on, that's changed dramatically this year. Okay, so we're going to have a PDF that you can download, which has like a homework quiz with vocabulary and some worked problems. You do all of that stuff on your own, and then you go back to Blackboard to enter your answers. And so you go on and enter your answers. There'll be some multiple choice. There'll be some numerical answers. The numerical answers, I put in... Uh, like a plus or minus 5%, I think that's on this next one. So you, you wanna to work to understand the terms and answer the multiple choice problems. And then the numerical problems, you enter your answers. And I put in a plus or minus 5% um, range uh, so that uh, you don't miss because we round it differently. Like if I use the full Planck's constant and you just use 6.26, .6, then we're gonna get slightly different answers, but it shouldn't be more than 5%. Uh, scientific notation you use E to replace the 10 to the, okay? So this is how you would enter Avogadro's number in the quiz, 6.022 E plus 23, okay? Everybody clear on that? Yes. Yes, if you put spaces in there, then it might treat it as text. And so just, yeah, no spaces. Um, no no units either so it's got to be a number so that blackboard can pick up and check the number so it'll say in the problem what units i want you to use and pay very close attention to the units on all your pkim problems uh, i don't know what percentage it is but it's well over 50 percent of the problems are unit problems meaning problems is uh, is confusing uh, well over 50 percent of the mistakes that you make are units related <laughs> you know the the problems are you know vocabulary and, and and written problems and so on but in order to do the numerical problems you have to focus on the units so that you can guide yourself through uh, the the procedure and more than 50 percent of your mistakes are related to units and not having the correct units You only get two attempts. That's in case you make a typo or something like that. So don't waste them. Um, and then if you wait until Saturday night, I think it's 11.59 is when it closes. Um, do them early because you know how Blackboard is. You don't want to get on there at, at, at you know 11.30 and miss points for procrastination. You know, So uh, I won't turn it back on. It's just you know when it's due and then we'll be um, we'll be you know, cruising through the semester. If you miss one, let's say you just didn't get it done, it's not the end of the world. You know, um, you get, I think there's 15 or 16 weeks this semester. And so, you know, this, you're gonna have lots of homework points and it's a percentage of the points. So, yeah, so don't, don't go crazy on me if you miss one. Okay, Quizlet, there's a, in the past when we were doing uh, points for different activities. One of my points was to create definitions on a Quizlet. And so they built a pretty deep study set for this course. So this is from a couple of years ago. Um, so you've got them, those students to thank. So you have all the vocabulary, most of the vocabulary for this course on Quizlet so that you can go, if you've never used Quizlet, it is fantastic. 
uh, because you can go on and you can make yourself flashcards. Uh, if you have, uh, you know, three or four people in your study group, you can do a, um, a contest, a Quizlet Live. Um, you have to have an account to do that. So go ahead. You can make yourself a free Quizlet account. Search for my online name, Kim underscore prof, and you can find my uh, Quizlet study sets. And then in class, uh, occasionally we'll do cahoots. And so you're definitely encouraged to bring a, an internet capable device, an iPad or phone, and you can uh, participate in the in-class cahoots. I will, depending on if everybody has one or whatever, I can, I can use that for attendance or I can still just use the roster. So we'll, we'll be flexible with that. If you don't have a device, I can still mark you down as present. So you don't have to worry about not being able to do the cahoot or if your battery's dead. Okay. All right, so here's where to find me. And I accept social media um, connections. I don't. I don't post anything personal, or I try not to, so we can connect. But I don't post any um, any class like required information on Facebook or Twitter or anything like that. So if it's official from me about this class, it'll be through Blackboard, okay? And it'll also be to your SHSU email through Blackboard. So I'll put announcements on Blackboard and I'll send them out to your SHSU email. So you definitely need to keep that inbox clean. Um, how many people have really explored Outlook, you know, the university's Outlook for your email? Anybody? A few people? Yeah, so some people are kind of sort of saying that. Outlook has some filtering tools. So get on there and try to learn how to um, like put in a rule that um, may put all of the emails with 4448 eight in the title or in the subject line, dump them into a class related folder or whatever so that if you've got tons and tons of spam, all of the emails from Blackboard will go into their own folder. And then you can always see, oh, here's my class related stuff. So there's a lot of things you can do in Outlook that will help simplify your life. This is a, a skill that you need going forward because uh, let me tell you, my life is just destroyed by email. There's so much of it. I could spend all day answering email and there's a lot of important things on email, but I wouldn't get class notes made. I wouldn't get tests posted. Um, that's my number one problem with my job is trying to manage the amount of email traffic I get and get my job done. And you're going to be doing the same thing as you move into the workforce, as you move through your education, managing the volume of email. You can't just shut it like you can't just ignore the problem because it will not go away. It'll only get worse. And you're going to start missing things like exam announcements and, and important things for registration and, you know, payment deadlines. And I mean, you have to be able to manage email. Um, and I'm preaching to, to myself, too. That's my number one issue is trying to manage the amount of volume of email that I get. So don't I know. I, some students I've worked with in the past, it's sort of, they just let their email go, go to seed, you know, it looks like a unkept field and they start working on text only, but I, I can't do that easily through Blackboard. And I want also for you to, to join me in trying to figure out how we're going to manage this email volume, because that's the way we communicate in the modern world. Okay. So let's go to the, the, um, let's go to the syllabus next. So here's the top of the syllabus, and this is that change log I was talking about. This is, again, the first version was 8.05. Um, I'm going to um, go through it again today. And there's some, again, some discussion about points down here in the attendance. Although I don't, I don't know that I have to change it. This 10 points per week is the thing I need to change. So the homework on Blackboard, it's on average 10 points per week, some weeks. I guess that I don't have to change that. Some some weeks it may be 10, other weeks if I have, uh, if I'm inspired and I write two more problems, it'll be 12, <laughs> okay? Or if there just happens to be a ton of vocabulary and I wanna make sure you have lots of multiple choice to emphasize all these new words, then you know it might be 15 or 20. But um, it's, I'm not gonna give you like, 20 more um, 
long problems to do, but it'll probably be, you know, 15 or 20 more vocabulary words and things like that. So, uh, <clears throat> so anyway, that's where we stand. So actually this is, this is pretty accurate. So what we're going to do, uh, let's start from the top. You can find me, my office hours are going to be posted on Blackboard. And honestly, I had so many more people participate in office hours when I did them on Zoom than before. Uh, and so I'm going to go ahead and do office hours on Zoom so that you can get me wherever you are so that you can log in. Is everybody still capable of doing Zoom? You can find a computer, even a campus computer, perhaps, and you can check in with me and then I can pull up whatever we're doing on my computer, share screen. You can ask questions and I've got my little touch tablet here and I can do the math with you uh, on the screen. And, and I think it works out really well because, uh, you know, we're able to talk face to face and pull up documents. And if you want to show me something that you're working on, then you can share your screen. And it's a lot more convenient than us trying to nestle up to a computer at my desk and so on. And nobody has to insert drives into anybody else's computer. We don't get viruses, stuff like that. There's more, more than one vi virus, right? Corona is not the only virus. <laughs> uh, the book, I really would like for you to have the 11th edition of Atkins. Uh, but that way we, we're talking the same page numbers, same problems and things like that. Um, <clears throat> although I will put all of the problems that I want you to do on Blackboard. You can always do more. You can do the example problems in the chapter and, and teach yourself some of the things that you need to know. But here's the deal. Here, how many people really know how to read a science book? Okay, you read those books with a pencil, with a notebook, a calculator, Google, Wikipedia. I mean, when you're reading a science text, it's not like reading a novel. You don't start at chapter one and just start going. Okay, most science texts are reference texts, and that's the way this book is written. And so you will dive into the certain material that you're interested in using the index or the table of contents, or you know, you scan through, you find a figure that I had in class, and you want to know more about that. You start reading the paragraphs before and after, or maybe go to the beginning of that section and start reading, and you're gonna get hit with a lot of words that you don't know. Don't skip over them, okay? Say, so, wow, I'm not understanding that. I'm gonna go Google that word. I'm gonna to go to Wikipedia, or I'm gonna you know, um, look in the index and maybe find where that word is first introduced and maybe find a definition in the text, okay? Um, I keep talking about Wikipedia. It's not a good primary source, like for a lab report or anything, but it's really good in, in terms of chemistry. In ter you know, it's been vetted by a, you know good grad students, postdocs, and professors who make pages related to their work, and so it's it's a great place to start. And if you want to know more information, you can look at the references in Wikipedia and go to the original documents. So I'm a, I'm a pretty big fan of of looking at. Now sometimes it's written like. Um, not like a chemist would write it. You know, if you're looking up group theory on Wikipedia, you're going to get the mathematics version of group theory. And it's going to confuse you. And so if you start seeing it looks like it's not at all related to the class, then you know you've got a bad, bad thread. Okay, so back up and try something else. If you still can't find what you're looking for, then that's the time to email me with a specific question. The more specific the question, the faster I can respond. Okay, I don't get it is a terrible question. <laughs> right. So, so if you uh, really don't get something, try to drill a little bit deeper to figure out what it is specifically that's confusing you, especially if you can find the word that's confusing you. And then you shoot me a question about that word and I can, you know, answer that, you know, between dinner and dessert, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. These are some of the things that we're going to learn this semester. So after the semester, you'll be able to identify the experiments that illustrated the need for quantum theory. That's right here at the beginning of the course. You'll be able to use math, the math of quantum theory on the shoulders of Boltzmann and Planck and Schrodinger and Dirac. So you'll understand the math that they did. Now we're going to do it in one dimension uh, because that's easier to understand. And then by analogy, we'll expand to three dimensions. And then you'll, uh, be able to interpret spectroscopic measurements. So you can take a spectrum and you can pull the quantum numbers out of that spectrum and understand what's going on with the molecule. We're gonna solve for the bond length of carbon monoxide to like five decimal places. So that's 10 to the minus 15, plus or minus 10 to the minus 15 meters. That's your uncertainty. Isn't that crazy? 
You can do that with spectroscopy. We're going to be demonstrating the, and understanding the use of symmetry and group theory. So you'll understand uh, point groups and, and how to label molecules with their point group symmetry and how to use that in spectroscopy. <clears throat> you'll get to learn about computational chemistry. So Gaussian, if you haven't used Gaussian before, you'll be able to model the shapes of molecules, their energies, their structures, and their spectra. And then you'll be able to uh, become an, an Excel ninja <laughs> when you come out of this course. And that's probably the most translatable skill. It doesn't matter what job you go into next, uh, your use of Excel will really do treat you well. Uh, we had uh, one student, he um, got a job. He, he was trying to find a job in chemistry. He graduated this chemistry degree, but uh, he needed to pay the bills right away. So he got a job at like an airport and, and uh, his boss had some report and he said, do you know how to make a graph? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I think I know how to make a graph. <laughs> so he put his data in Excel and graphed whatever it was. I don't even remember. And uh, of course, it wasn't just graph the data. It was what's the X axis? What's the Y axis? What's the chart about, you know, and the legend and everything. And he gave it to his boss and his boss looked at it and said, I'm not paying you enough. Someone's going to steal you from me. And he got a raise on the spot. <laughs> so, so that's what I'm talking about, translatable skills. You know, that had nothing to do with chemistry, but the skills he learned in PCHEM got him a raise immediately. You know, your mileage may vary, but still, that was a good one. He wrote me back on Facebook and said, you won't believe what just happened. <laughs> so uh, attendance is worth 5%. The homework quizzes are worth 15% of your grade. So, uh, the way those are calculated is you have an average at the end of the semester, and I'll be able to calculate it during the semester. Um, there's like max points available, and then there's max points that someone in class got, and then like nobody may have 100 on it. So let's say the max points was 95, and whatever, um, let's make it easy, 90, okay? And let's say your points are, are 45, that's half of 90, so you have a 50% um, homework score at that point. Um, as, as opposed to 40%, right? So you have 40 points out of 100 max, but the max performance was 90, and so you have you have half of that, so you have 50 instead of 45. And then same with homework, I mean with attendance, okay? There's so many class periods, and it's whatever percentage of those class periods that you're here that your attendance grade. And then that's multiplied by 0.05 and added with the homework average times 0.15 and so on. Your exams are worth 60% of your grade. They used, uh, yeah, 60% of your grade. There are six exams. So each exam is 10% of your final average. And then the laboratory is worth 20% of your grade. And so uh, you say, well, golly, that's a lot of work for only 20%. But a lot of the lab material is on the exam. And so doing well on the lab will help you do well on the exams. So, in. Okay, this is just how those are calculated. Now, occasionally someone digs a hole for themselves. Um, I want the holes at the beginning of the semester to be filled in, okay? So for those on exam one and two with grades less than 50, so they've really, they've really dug a hole, okay, uh, for whatever reason, the, there's the thing called a, an exam wrapper. It's, it's having you analyze how you're studying, what you're doing, uh, what tripped you up on about, about that exam and so on and it can raise that grade up to a 60 Okay, so that you at least fill in the hole. You still got a you still got a divot that you can climb out of Okay, uh, I don't get rid of exams because I know I, when I was a student that was like, okay, great I can sleep in and like skip a whole exam What happens if you do that is you didn't study that material and that material is needed for the next exam? And it's so hard to be disciplined to take an exam you're not ready for, to study an exam you're struggling with. But you've got to do that so that you will do better on the next one and the next one and the next one. So the whole course builds. So if I let you throw something away, then you've just like cut off a foot. <laughs> and then now you're trying to run a marathon with no foot. Okay, so I can't do that to you. I know human nature. Um, I, I was there too. So this will allow you to dig yourself out of a hole if you dig one on exam one or two. Uh, but hopefully by the end of exam two, you've got your study skills going, 
you're preparing, you've got a study group, and so on, and then you can do well from that, that point forward. Okay. There's also a, a revision, one lab revision on the carbon monoxide lab. That's kind of a, a fully involved lab report with the introduction and theory and all of this stuff. And this is a writing component class. And the best way to re improve your writing is to give it to somebody, have them give you comments, and then you respond to every comment. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn in that first report. We have a couple other reports to write while the TA is grading those, and then you get to revise that first report and correct your grammar mistakes, correct your math, correct your conclusions, and then you get to turn that back in. And the cool thing about it is it's teaching you the skill of what I call a comment response table. So your TAs are gonna give you comments and you're gonna put those comments in the first column of a table and your response in the second column of the table and then what page number they can find those, those changes. So that way you can get familiar with how to respond to critical input because that is an important skill. Uh, you're going to miss it someday Right now in college, you get nothing but critical input, <laughs> right? I'm telling you, that answer was bad. You know, that you missed this point. So you didn't understand this vocabulary and so on. And you get into the workplace and no one tells you if you're doing a good or bad job. And you don't know why you're not getting a raise. And you know, it's mainly because you have a crummy boss, right? But if that boss doesn't tell you what you can do to improve, then you, um, then you have a, a problem. How can you improve? So the thing is, you, you will hopefully learn to crave critical input. And so this is an example to get some of that and to respond to it, okay? A lot of times you don't get that formal chance to respond to it. So that's new this semester. Okay. The rest I think is pretty straightforward. Let me, yeah, let me talk about the um, labs, if you, if you have a, um, an issue with turning in a lab or what have you, communication is the key, okay? Communicating with your uh, TA especially. And so when we say unannounced and unaddressed absence, that means you just didn't show up to lab that week, um, didn't turn in a report and so on. Um, and so think about the workplace if you were to do that, you know, just not show up for work and you had a really important job you would get fired, right? Well, I can't fire you, uh, but the, the, I want to emphasize you've got to show up at least, okay? Or communicate if you can't. And so that's why it's so harsh. It's a failing grade in the whole course if you just blow off a lab and not turn in a report, okay? Um, even if it's like six weeks late, you turn in your name, turn in the title of the report, you've got to do something, okay? Work it out with your TA, all right? Now, late work. Okay, let's look at this late work thing. I absolutely hated the, the situation where you're one minute late and you lose half your points. You know what I'm talking about? You know, sometimes you, you, they want to emphasize turning it in on time, but that's just like one minute or 30 minutes late and you've lost half the report's points. So I thought, we're peak chemists, we can understand math. And so I have an exponential decay for your points. <laughs> okay, so, so the half-life of your lab is 24 hours, okay? So if it's, if it's a perfect lab report, every answer is perfect, and it's turned in 24 hours late, your max points is half, okay? But if it's just one hour late, it's uh, e to the minus one hour times the log of two divided by i need to correct this formula it should be 24 hours i have eight hours here but I, so i need to make that change so yeah so you could calculate what your max available is and guess what it's going to be 99 percent of the points are still available at one hour okay so if you're 30 minutes late an hour late there's no step function it's not falling off a cliff it's an exponential decay okay and it bottoms out at not at zero but at one point Okay, and now I use that one point just to indicate to me that you turn something in. Because at the end of the semester, when I'm looking at the lab grades, if I see a zero there, then it's F time. Okay, but if you turn something in, you get that one point that communicates to me you turned something in, even if it was really late, 
um, and and that's okay. You 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 checked that box. So you're not fired. Okay, a lot of room for improvement, but you're not fired. Okay, so that's that's good. So let me check this um, half life. So I'm going to be making that change. That that formula is incorrect. I changed it from eight hours to twenty four because eight hours the TA was telling me it was a little fast on the decay rate. So <laughs> so, <laughs> so we're gonna we're gonna give you guys a little bit more time. We've extended it three times. Okay, um, half life. All right, so we're good with that. Sounds like you like the exponential decay. Homework quizzes are straightforward. Exams. Uh, Bring a three and a half inch note card with equations on the exam so you can use that. Save those. You don't turn those in with your exam because you can use all of them on the final. Okay. So at the final, you can have six note cards so that you can remember the equations from three months ago. And they have to be handwritten. I don't want someone making a really like microfiche note card and then photocopying it for the class. Because the reason I do the note card is not so much exam day. It's that's your that's your little battle bag. What are you going to take in your in your go bag? <laughs> that's what you're taking into battle. And so you got to decide: Do I really need that equation? Do I really need to put PV equals nRT on there? Or can I remember that one? Because <laughs> Boltzmann's equation is a lot bigger and it's a little bit more difficult. Okay, so all right. So then uh, we have uh, what about sickness? You know, we still have a pandemic going on. Um, we've got the YouTube videos. Um, contact me. Let me know. And so, um, if you, you know, if you let me know with a with a sort of a test report or doctor's note or something like that, then um, the homework won't the, the attendance won't count against you. But I need documentation for that to happen. All right. If I get COVID, okay, uh, then what we will probably do since all of my lectures are on. Uh, YouTube, I will, I will put a video list up. And so then for however many weeks I'm in the hospital, Lord forbid, <laughs> then uh, then you guys can, can do those videos and then with the TAs and so on, we'll be able to answer your questions and we'll, we'll get through it. Okay. Uh, cheating, uh, you know, if you do your own work, and everybody's doing their own work and nobody's using work from previous semesters and so on, then everybody sort of has a this mutual respect going on. Everybody's working hard. It's difficult. You know, you may need help and y'all get together. That's fine. Study together, form groups. Uh, but in terms of writing your reports and doing your own Excel workbooks, you know, you're doing your Excel, your buddy's doing his or her Excel. Y'all can say, how did you do this formula? Okay. What's going on? Um, and help each other that way, but don't do this business of, I finished the lab, here's my spreadsheet. Or someone from the previous, your your roommate took it last year, and I say, here's you know my spreadsheet, here's my report. Don't copy it, just start with this. Now, I, I catch people all the time with the same typos as a person the year before, <laughs> the same math mistakes, <laughs> you know, a wrong constant, you know, the, these are, really low on the probability that you would make the exact same constant mistake that someone did before. And so it's really easy to catch that. So just do your own work. You're going to be much better off doing that. And I, I hate having to like put somebody on disciplinary action with the university because that's, that's, it's awful. It makes my stomach hurt. So be positive, be engaged. Um, don't be a toxic person, you know, that complains about everything. <laughs> you know, you get them in the lab sometimes where they're like, just doing nothing but bitching and moaning about, I hate Excel, you know, this is so, well, I thought this was a chemistry class, you know, and, and it just brings the mood down for everybody. And I asked the TAs, I was like, you got any toxic people in there? Because we need to nip this in the butt. You know, and you may not know you are. <laughs> and the TA pulls you aside and says, you know, your attitude is spreading and it's not good. It's, you know, you, people are on the fence sometimes and a toxic person just pulls them down, you know, and then they hate it and they're miserable. And, you know, they weren't going to be miserable until that happened. So uh, be positive. Yeah. And I'm not bothered if your phone goes off in class. You know, if you sit there and have a conversation like the people in Starbucks, uh, you know, 
just exit. Sometimes people have emergencies, they got kids or whatever, um, you know, it's not a big deal. Just don't be a major disruption. All right. This is kind of my philosophy in the box. If you approach this course as if 100% of the learning depended upon you, and I approach the course as if 100% of the learning depended upon me, we're probably going to have a good semester. Okay. But if you're sitting back there thinking you can sit in front of me three hours a week and learn PKIM <laughs> without doing anything, that's, I'm not that good. I'll tell you right now, <laughs> but I'm going to try to be that good that just, I can explain it so well after this hour, you walk out and you go, man, I got it, you know, but then uh, you approach it to where like, oh, Williams is just useless. I'm going to have to learn this on my own. Um, you know, you take that attitude, man, we're going to have a great semester. And so that's, that's good. Okay. So that's the syllabus. That's uh, what is PCAM? Uh, we've got four or five minutes for questions. Surely this sparked an idea or two in your head. Yes. So I remember for your test makeup for exam one and two, it's only going to be grade below a 50. What if you get like a 51 and you want to make it up to a 60? Um, to me, I just cho I chose those numbers. I'm just going to stick with those numbers. Um, you can still do it. What it is, it's metacognition. So it's a, it's thinking about your thinking. And it just, it just sort of forces you to analyze your study skills. It forces you to make a schedule. And so sometimes that's, a, that's something that people hadn't thought of, you know, to actually schedule your study time uh, and to make it kind of an aggressive schedule with certain goals. I'm gonna finish the homework by this time. I'm gonna go through the videos again if I want to by this time. And if I've done that, then those last two hours I've scheduled are free time. So you kind of build in perks and say, all right, if I can finish by Thursday, then I've got Friday afternoon off. But if I don't finish by Thursday, then I'm going to have to tell my friends, no, I can't go to eat or whatever, you know. So that's um, that's sort of a preview of what's on that exam wrapper. Everybody can do it, but it's for those folks that really bury themselves below a 50. Um, you know. And it just is um, since it's such a different course and it's not memorization, a lot of times some people just really you know, bomb that first exam and they're like, I'm quitting chemistry. I had a student who was like a awesome chemistry major, straight A student, make a 44 on the first exam. And they came to me and was like, I quit. I was like, what do you mean you quit? I'm changing my major. I was like, get off the bridge. <laughs> We're going to be okay. You know, and, and uh, she got an A in the course. She dug herself out of that hole. It did, it did really well. Yes. So, you know, since you uh, told the story, you know, like that, of a student coming in here and, and bombing a first exam like that, uh, when it comes to getting ready for exams, do you go over, uh, I don't know, how to, how to, what to look for, how exactly to say. Right. I try to do that. And, and, and definitely that's a valid question, too, when we're going over the material. Don't ask the question, is this on the exam? But ask, how do I study this, you know, to prepare me for the exam? That's a better, how do I study this particular material uh, so that I can do well on the exam? And, and I can then tell you, okay, I'm really showing you this math or whatever for this vocabulary word. And so if you understand this vocabulary words related to this math, then you've got the concept. And so always ask for clarification. I would like a lot more back and forth with you during class. Okay. And so that's, that's, that's how I'd love for you to approach that. Yeah. That's great. Thanks. Anyone else? What needs clarification? As far as the labs, uh, homework, I'm, for the labs, I'm trying to focus on a particular skill each week, and then we start writing full lab reports. So like I'll focus on charting data, I'll focus on putting equations into Word, and so on, and we'll focus on the ACS style, which that style guide is amazing. Um, it, it tells you, you know, when there's a space between the number and the unit, or how to write an equation, or how to reference um, you know, site material and so on. So the style guide is your friend. You can go in and look at those chapters and learn exactly how to write like a chemist or a scientist. It'll tell you word choices and everything. So it'll be a long scavenger hunt for that week. Yes. Are the test questions going to be modeled off the ACS exam? 
You know, I've seen that exam a couple of times. Yes and no. Some of them would be. I mean, the multiple choice ones, because the ACX exam is very similar to just a multiple choice test, you know, and sometimes there's some calculations. But but I like to see you show your work. So there'll be a, a one or two problems where you have to show your work. I like to have a range of questions. Uh, some questions I call pulse questions, and that is it's, it's meant to be so easy that if you have a pulse, you'll get it. <laughs> okay. And then there's some questions that require sort of one level of, of critical thinking. Um, then I'll have a, a question or two that I like where, you know, what's wrong with this? Like, here's, here's an equation, or here's a thing, what's wrong with this? Because that's tapping a different part of your brain, you know, and, and then I'll have a, you know, calculation or two. So uh, I try to give a, a variety of test type question types and different levels of skill so that I can see, okay, these people have a pulse. These people have a pulse plus the ability to um, remember how two things are related. And then these people have the ability to analyze something and infer something else. You know, so um, there's, you may have heard of Bloom's taxonomy. There's sort of listing things. That's the pulse type stuff, just recall. Um, and then there's the analysis. And then there's the evaluation level. So evaluation or self-evaluation is really far at the top. Okay. All right, that's time. I'll see you on Wednesday.